Hi, thanks all for coming. Um, I'm going to show you a mix of work. Some of it uh, was done over the last few years and some is work in progress. Um, quite a lot of what I'm showing you will be configured in various ways in my Venice inst uh, installation, but uh, hopefully, or my wish is that the individual works become combined and subsumed into a whole that is different than looking at them sequentially and individually. So, and I'm happy to ask any questions um, at the end. Um, so, uh, I thought I'd start with uh, an image of a newspaper headline from Australia, which was published maybe about oh, three weeks ago um, in the Australian version of the Financial Review. Uh, and the before the newspaper went to press, when the um, the paste up of the front page was being done. Uh, the mock up, whoever was in charge of doing that, put in some text which should, should have been corrected before it was published. And in Australia, every state, because Australia is made up of different states, every state except one, Western Australia, published, or they corrected it, but Western Australia didn't obviously notice it or get round to it. So it, it makes a lot of sense if you're Australian. Um, and the, the thing, uh, the, the review got into the trouble big time, into trouble big time, although lots of people have subsequently said, yeah, we agree with the sentiments. I think the one that got up people's noses most might be, um, uh, it's arms build up, you know, buys planes, the world is F-U-K-T. Um, uh, and it's a sentiment that I also uh, agree with. I mean, excuse my language uh, if anyone is offended, but yeah, I agree, the world is pretty fucked. Um, and that's really what a lot of my work is about. Um, I've got a detail of that. But also, um, I think it's quite interesting talking in Hong Kong with the, um, uh, the headline on the upper left, Germany 1914, China uh, 2014, and this came out just before our national uh, day for remembering all the wars that Australia's fought in, uh, called Anzac Day, um, uh, which is probably one reason why there's a reference to Germany in, to, in uh, 1914. Um, uh, but I thought, yeah, it's sort of quite telling. Australia is very linked with China now, and there has been this fear in our media of the Chinese who want to have a bigger presence in the Pacific, you know, with ships and so on. So, um, uh, now, why is that? Yep, that's just a detail of the arms build up, buys planes, the world is fucked a bit. Um, so, just to get back to my work now, um, uh, to, to sort of summarise the ideas that I have in my head that I'm working on with, with recent and current work, um, for me, uh, the work is a mix of the madness, the badness and the sadness of uh, the, current, um, uh, the current situation that we're all connected, you know, uh, connected into globally. Um, and I don't think I need to spell out any of the politics there. I think, you know, we're all, we're all kind of like, um, uh, you know, like sort of pawns in the in the mega ocean of you know global politics, um, and caught up in ways that we'd probably prefer not to be, um, environmentally, financially, uh, in terms of conflict and so on. Um, can we go on to the video, please? Um, I thought this was also appropriate to show in the context of Hong Kong. Um, uh, this is uh, a. A, a small bit of video I shot very recently um, inside one of those little Chinese uh, boxes with a very romantic scene of a China which um, doesn't seem to really exist anywhere much in reality. It's, but it's the China of, you know, our imaginations from uh, bygone eras um, of the, you know, the pagoda in the, um, the lovely landscape uh, with the beautiful rocks and you know, the sort of like cultivated, you know, plants and so on. Um, so, uh, the, of course, the spiders are some kind of metaphor for um, the, uh, the overtaking, the erosion, the, the ominous um, uh, aspects of 
uh, of the way that not just China has impacted on the, the global mix of things, but um, the way our, um, uh, our world seems to be crumbling. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, obviously, but the way that our world seems to be crumbling um, and disintegrating in all sorts of ways that we hold dear, I mean, not, not least, uh, as I said, with the environment. Um, there is a second bit of video also of spiders. We might skip that, uh, if that's okay. If you can just show this, this first piece, it will finish in a minute. This is unedited, and as they say, you know, uh, working with kids and animals when you're um, filming isn't easy. Um, <laughs> spi spiders, you know, they just do their own thing. Um, uh, so, anyway, yep. Um, so to move, oh, okay, so we're, we're starting on the second. I, I, I can't show you still images and video at the same time, unfortunately, so I'll have to keep talking while this is rolling. Um, uh, as I said, much the, the, the driving um, key words to describe my, my, my current work uh, are madness, badness, and sadness. And uh, in the three sort of main areas of global, global conflict, global finances, and uh, the environment, and about how, how these different um, uh, facets are all, you know, part of the same, the same whole. And, and, and these are the things which are the driving forces behind um, what I'm working on for the Venice Biennale. Um, uh, sorry, I'll, <laughs> I'll have to let this run. This piece has been edited, um, and I hope we don't have too many arachnophobes here. No one's rushed out in absolute horror. Um, uh, I, I should also say, while this is running, um, just from a personal perspective, I've never, I've never been to China, to, 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 or to China or to Hong Kong before. I've long wanted to come, um, and. Um, uh, just coming, you know, just arriving yesterday, uh, we hear so much from the Australian side, and I know quite a few people in the audience here are Austra Australian, about how China's been, you know, our economy's been really buoyant in the last few years because China's been buying all of um, our minerals um, uh, and turning them into skyscrapers and bridges and... Uh, white goods and, you know, heaven knows what. Um, and just coming into Hong Kong yesterday, I was absolutely astounded at, you know, the scale, the immensity. And actually, um, I have to say that the, the utter beauty in a particular kind of sort of, uh, in the way of a, a, a metropolis of our time, you know, the, uh, the, the, the scene here is, it's a, far, it's a far cry from, you know, this little... Um, little vignette in these little boxes of uh, some, some sort of almost storybook idea now of, of China. Um, for me anyway, growing up in a, a, another British colony aside from Hong Kong uh, in Australia. Sorry, two videos must have been a bit of overkill. Um, I think it continues for a while yet. I think there's a bit of um, sort of cannibalism towards the end. Um, so. Sorry? Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't actually know what kind of medical condition. Um, uh, seeing a spider unexpectedly uh, puts an arachnophobe in. Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't sort of thought that that would be... And, and in fact, I mean, you're looking at the video on a large screen here, but um, uh, spiders, even big spiders, are quite small things, so they won't be... The, the, neither the video nor, hopefully, the actual spiders in my installation will be... Um, uh, much larger than life size in terms of the video. Uh, so, um, yeah. Um. 
I should also say, I mean, as I'm, as I, I don't want to talk about the other works until this is run through, but, you know, having a particular interest in um, the minutiae of our world in, in, in very small things like spiders and insects and, and other living organisms in, uh, across the spectrum, you know, plants as well. Um, the world is really an amazing place. In Australia, we, we're having a current debate about what species we will save from extinction. This has been a very recent debate, and that's utterly terrifying to me, and I think to um, a lot of other people. It's actually been our environmentalists that have come out and said, look, you know, there are so many, you know, environmental pressures. Um, we have to uh, prioritise um, uh, some of them. We can't save every habitat. Um, so that, that's a new uh, debate, which is scary, which has just um, uh, arisen in the last, really, sort of four months. Sorry, we're just about... Oh, no, it's repeating. Oh, no. <laughs> no, not again. Please switch it off. <laughs> um, okay, so back to... Could we switch that off, please? Thanks. Oh, I must have... Um, back to my work in general, uh, th this, uh, this and the next work also have uh, small videos in the, um, uh, in apertures in the, the skulls. These are made from uh, old drink cans. I'm not sure if you can get these brands in Hong Kong, but certainly in Europe and America and Australia, mother, a high caffeine drink, um, monster an equally high, if not higher, caffeine drink. Um, and I'm sort of interested in that crossover between popular culture and uh, the way not just, that, not just that high art and popular culture seem to have some meeting place, which is, you know, a total blend, which is fas very fascinating, uh, I know, to a lot of artists. Um, but um, uh, how, uh, how these beautiful you know, products which are so beautifully packaged in, in all sorts of ways, how uh, one can use the message carried in the product to interface with another message, another overlay uh, that's integrated into the work. And that actually informs a lot of my work. And particularly, um, a medium that I've been working with a lot in recent years and continuing to work with now is uh, camouflage patterns from different militaries around the globe. Uh, both from actual garments, which this is made from, and also from the patterns applied to other surfaces. This here, um, I, I've spent a fair bit of time in Sri Lanka over the last sort of 15 or so years, um, and they've had a cruel civil war going, which supposedly has finished, um, although they, they have a very despotic government, so I won't go in, into all of that. But this is actually um, the Sri Lankan Sinhalese army uh, current uniform. Uh, this work is called uh, Portrait of the Victor, and as you can see, it's made from uh, the actual sort of uh, military garment. Um, and then these ones, uh, the next images are animals which are highly endangered, uh, also made from military garments um, from the uh, country that the species comes from, uh, with other elements added in. So. Th uh, so this is a panda from China. With, uh, these are just details uh, using a Chinese military garment. Uh, and these were part of my... Uh, these endangered uh, species were part of my uh, installation at Documenta um, in the most recent 19, uh, 2013 Documenta. A gorilla, which is... Um, and most of these have got a critical, criti critically endangered sta status. There's a, a list... Uh, called the IUCN Red List of um, creatures uh, which, are, which have been assessed as being endangered, and there's all too many things on that list. This is um, uh, from the Congo, uh, an American condor, critically endangered. Um, and th these are obviously made much larger than life. Uh, Siberian tiger, Russian uniform. Um, and you're looking at them here outside of the, uh, the context of the installation. I do have one installation shot. Uh, a mink in a German uniform. Um, fur seal, Norwegian uniform. 
uh, a critically endangered French dragonfly. It's some of the smallest things uh, on the planet which are suffering the most um, because their environments are disappearing. Axolotl from Mexico. Um, they abound in pet shops and home aquariums around the world, but they need crystal clean uh, water in the mountains of Mexico, and there's not much of that left these days. Um, so they're pretty well on the way out, pretty well gone in the wild. Um, uh, Australia's most endangered bird, the night parrot. Oh, this is this is an installation shot of my um, uh, my work uh, at Documenter. I was one of the artists that had like a little house in a in a park. Um, uh, in Castle, and um, mine was set up to be a cross between an army bunker and a hunter's den and a cabinet of curiosity. So you get an idea of how, you know, there was a lot of interfacing of not just the uh, particular sort of organisms I just showed you, but other elements as well. Um, On to another camouflage work I did for the Sydney Biennale back in 2010. Um, uh, this one is called. Um, the Barbarians at the Gates. Um, and this was a, a series of beehives uh, that were working beehives um, in, placed in the City Botanic Gardens um, uh, during the City Biennale. Uh, and each one is painted in a camouflage, the camouflage pattern um, of a nation involved in uh, the political sort of uh, strife in the Middle East. Um, and then on top of each uh, beehive is a um, model of an architectural edifice from uh, that nation um, as a key to what the nation is. Um, and these were planted, or, uh, th these were placed in a, um, a small uh, field of wheat because wheat... Wheat is a um, staple crop that actually, in its wild state, originated in well, what was called the, called the Fertile Crescent, um, uh, and then became Persia and is now Iraq. So wheat actually, in its wild state, it evolved in Iraq. And so most of our other grains, most of, most of the main grains except for rice and corn, actually come from the Middle East, which I find really fascinating. Um, so this is, this is a thing called a Nissan hut, an Australian, well, a British Australian uh, building, which I won't go into. Um, uh, so as I said, these, are these were countries from both sides, or from uh, the multifaceted sides of the um, uh, militaries uh, fighting in the Middle East, in Iraq, and now in Afghanistan. Um, Hakia Sophia uh, from Istanbul. Um, the Dome of the Rock, Israel. Um, I don't have all of them on slide. There are about 20 altogether. Uh, Germany, the Brandenburg Gate. Um, uh, Pakistan, a mausoleum of, I forget the guy's name, but he was the father of the guy that built the Taj Mahal. Um, uh, and the patterns, this is actually an American military pattern that the Americans used in the first Gulf War in 1990, but Interesting to me, um, that is now worn by the Pakistan army and some of the other armies, because Pakistan is supposedly an ally of the USA. Um, I, fi I find the whole terrain of camouflage patterns and um, how one country copies another, camo, you know, another country's camo pattern and everything, I find it endlessly fascinating. Um, Russia, it's Lenin's, uh, Lenin's tomb. Um, New Zealand, a, a marae, a Maori meeting house. Um, you can see on oh, on the left hand, on the right hand side, it's um, Egypt obelisks, and on the left hand side uh, is um, the Pantheon, Italy, uh, Iraq, uh, um, ancient minaret, um, which was bombed. Well, I was making this work actually in 2010. Uh, the top of it was damaged. Um, in the foreground, a, a, a pyramid of uh, the black pharaohs in Sudan, just behind it, um, Iran, 
uh, the tomb of Cyrus the Great, a really ancient monument, um, Houses of Parliament, London. Um, oh, sorry, that was the last one on slide. Um, uh, on to very current work, but also again continuing the whole camo thing. Um, these are a series of heads I'm making of, um, uh, from a spectrum of different uh, militaries, different uh, nations, different regimes. Um, and this work is called All the King's Men. It's very much a, a, a work in progress. So I have um, six pieces here on slide or on images of. Um, f the first one was France. I mean, the countries are in some ways more arbitrary than in, say, the previous work with the beehives um, that was about specifically about the Middle East. Uh, this work here is more about the fact that, you know, uh, so many nations actually have military garments, and if, if, it's, if it's a nation that can't afford to manufacture its own um, military uniform, then they wear the casts off uh, from other, other countries. Um, uh, this is um, Italy. Uh, Nepal. Um, it's uh, Latvia or Czechoslovakia, um, Germany, Australia. Um, uh, as you can see, the skull is also a recurring image of mine, and of course I'm very aware, I mean, who could not be after D Damien Hirst's skull, that the skull is... Um, uh, well, it's, it, it's a potent image of, um, you know, hip sort of uh, hip street culture of, of our time. Um, but it's also an image which has been picked up by advertising um, by, and by, you know, sort of artists like myself. Um, uh, and in some ways, working with the skull, I think, as, as, as I've conversed with, with, with other um, artists and curators, it's sort of quite a dangerous thing because it's sort of like an overused image, but nevertheless, it's uh, potent. Um, so these are just a couple of shots of the skull. I think there's an installation shot in, a, uh, in an, uh, an installation in the Adelaide Biennial in Australia. Um, uh, this is another... Which, which was filled with skulls of various kinds. It was an installation called Out of My Tree. So I'm just about, I'm just showing you now some of the images from that. Um, uh, quite a range of uh, clocks, um, uh, mostly cuckoo clocks in that installation. Um, certainly not all, all of them painted with skulls, but, but uh, um, a number of them, and, and obviously the title of this installation, it was a room that you walked into with a sound element as well from the cuckoo clocks, but also other audio. Um, the title, Out of My Tree, in, uh, in English, uh, sort of vernacular, it means I'm going crazy, or you could say, oh, you know, she's out of a tree, you know, like she's, she's, she's mad. Um, and for me, it's, it, it's a metaphor again for, you know, personally how I feel. Well, not about myself, although undoubtedly I am mad, but about, you know, the sort of the state of play of the world that we all, you know, share. Um, and a, a, and a, a lot of despair, I must say, a lot of personal despair um, and sadness about that world. Um, this is that, that skull, uh, again, um, in the installation with wallpaper uh, I designed behind um, the skull again on, this work's called uh, vaporized little sort of found perfume bottles with skulls and then a, a mobile phone there with a, a hand skeleton painted on it. Um, oh, one of, one of the uh, installation shots of the, inst uh, of the work. Um, a detail of uh, the wallpaper. Um, uh, the skull again... Uh, using money. I've worked it quite extensively with American dollars. Um, that's one example. Uh, a, a couple, uh, this and the next image are bark cloths. I've spent time in Tonga um, with some New Zealand artists on a project a few years ago and uh, across the Pacific, the, the um, uh, main uh, 
medium aside from, say, carving, uh, which has been used across, on the islands across the Pacific from as far uh, west as, say, Hawaii, all the way through to Papua New Guinea as uh, bark cloth or tarpa. It's got different names in different islands, which is um, the beaten bark of the uh, uh, paper mulberry, which I think is actually a Chinese species originally, and then uh, dyes and ochres, uh, all, all the dyes made out of plant materials and the ochre dug up from the ground. Th this, this one here is called Hand Over Fist, um, and this one is Out of My Tree, which is the as I said, the title of that installation. Um, it's a really beautiful medium uh, in so many ways. Um, oh, and then a few other tapas as well that were in a show from New Zealand I did, uh, again with the skull image. Uh, the text is a bit tricky to read. It's meant to be in the work um, Cutthroat Karma. Um, Send money homeless. Skin in the game. Skin in the game, it's an interesting financial term. Uh, this is just a shot of one of the many uh, bird's nests I've made from shredded American dollars. Um, oh, sorry, I don't, I, don't, I don't have any more of that. Sort of a very extensive work called Tender of Bird's nests made sort of facsimile of shredded uh, American dollars. Um, uh, this is a shot of the work that uh, actually is on the Rosin Oxley Gallery stand at the art fair here. And this was done as part of um, the expedition I went on uh, where, where Tonga, where I began the bark cloth process, was part of uh, uh, in the last few years uh, an environmental uh, project to try and persuade the, the New Zealand government not to issue mining licenses for um, the, ocean, the ocean that's New Zealand territorial waters from the top of New Zealand all the way up to Tonga, um, uh, which under which lies what's called the Kermadec Trench, which is the um, fault line between the Aust Australasian and Pacific tectonic plates. Um, uh, and it's the second deepest in the world. It goes down 10 kilometers, and there's a lot of creatures down there uh, unknown to science. And there's also a lot of active volcanoes with um, uh, golden uh, rare metals in the volcano. So you can imagine there's international mining companies want to, wanting to blast the, the volcanoes to smithereens. So um, there's an American philanthropic group called Pew that's been um, funding uh, a, um, uh, a, a campaign to try and stop the New Zealand gov government from doing that. So, um, and some of, oh, and on, on the series which I have here at the art fair, uh, shipping flags, which um, I, I can't tell you exactly what each one of them uh, says without going back and referring to the label, but uh, it's a system of, um, communication between ships uh, from the past where you could run up one of these flags and it would say something like, um, I need help or, you know, uh, I'm taking in water or, you know, bas basically don't come near me, I'm carrying explosives or whatever. Um, so th this is one of the very deep sea uh, creatures they've, they've dragged out from uh, several kilometres down uh, in the Kermadec Trench, a dragonfish. Um, then I thought I would uh, end up with um, another component of a few installations I've done recently, and, and this is also a work in progress. Um, uh, again, I, I spent, although I'm Australian, I spent considerable time in New Zealand in the last few years, and each summer gone camping. Um, in a fairly isolated area and uh, near the coast um, and spent uh, a lot of time on the beach uh, noticing um, and then uh, really paying attention, uh, picking up bits of driftwood that look like uh, creatures. And the, the beach there is sort of a catacomb of the forest with bits of um, wood that have uh, washed down a, a river um, and out into the ocean and then sort of back up, blown back up on the beach in storms. 
Um, and um, uh, for me, it's a work which you would only know if you read the label that will accompany this when it's sort of like finally shown um, that the, the river that this wood comes from is actually a very degraded river, which is why there's, because of agricultural land mismanagement, which is why there's a lot more wood than there should be, you know, going down that river in the first place. Although it looks like a very innocent, um, benign work, it also has like a uh, an edge to it that's... Um, uh, refers to, you know, the ec economic drive to milk the most we can out of the land. And, and milk is probably the apt word because New Zealand is, is the nation more, than, you know, more than any other that's supplying so much uh, powdered uh, baby formula uh, to China um, because China's looking for some sort of uh, clean green um, uh, food, you know, to feed infants. It's, that, that's been like, you know, quite big in the media, certainly in Australia. Um, and New Zealand's got a clean green image, but, you know, like with most parts of the world, their clean green image isn't as clean and green as they would have us believe. Um, so, there's a history of uh, seeing, you know, things in the world in uh, natural materials which uh, are of the world, uh, such as bits of wood, stones, pictures in stones, um, uh, and so on. And of course, you know, there's a, that famous quote by Leonardo da Vinci of, you know, uh, if, if you have the imagination, you know, you can look at watermarks in a wall and you can conjure up landscapes and all sorts of magnificent things. So. Um, this driftwood, I think, comes from the same, the same sort of uh, mindset of just letting yourself go and, you know, the power of observation um, and the challenge to observe as well. Um, This is just, these are just ones I picked up this last January. I've been camping there for the last four years now, so I have, I have a few, and they're a nightmare to find, but it's, it's something to do during the day. Um, oh, and I'm going to end on, uh, this is just a small detail of an installation. Um, it's called uh, Ringbark. Uh, and I work a lot with, as you know, Australians here would know, I work a lot with found metal, um, like sort of metal from fish cans and so on. But th this is just made, you know, from the back of Coca-Cola cans or whatever. Um, so it's a very low relief uh, um, object as, as the actual object. Uh, you probably don't get a sense of that from the image. Um, anyway, I'd like to end up there. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Um, Questions? No? Yeah. Uh, we have a mic. Sorry, oh. Hi, Fiona. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, that was terrific. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you as an artist go about preparing for Venice? Because it's, you know, such a big thing, you know, in, in many artists' lives. And how do you deal with that as well as getting on with the rest of your life? Uh, you're not wrong. It is a big thing. Um, uh, I, I knew when I received the invitation, which came as a surprise for me, because now Australia just has a, a committee which chooses the artist. Uh, um, when I received, I think sort of early last October, the the invitation to, to be the artist to represent Venice next year. Um, I knew even while I was talking on the phone that time was going to be my worst enemy because, uh, as you can see with the last image um, here, uh, you know, to, to, get a, to get a material to transform takes time. You know, it doesn't... Uh, I'm always frustrated because there's never enough time, you know, to, to achieve, you know, the... the um, uh, the amount of work I want to, um, and actually, without wanting to to talk too too much about the specifics of my Venice installation, because it's still sort of early days, and 
Um, and also to, to talk about something which doesn't fully exist yet, uh, then the final thing is always different than the imagined thing. So I don't want to go there too much, but, but time being my worst enemy, the, time is a big clue in my um, Venice Biennale. Um, uh, so uh, the upside of feeling utterly terrified uh, on a daily basis, you know, about how much I don't get done in a day and about how much I want to do and need to do, um, the upside of that is I don't really have time to worry about the, um, uh, the, the overwhelming... Um, uh, you know, I've always thought that, Guinness, that Venice is the hardest gig there is. Um, uh, and you, it, it's, it, it, it's, I'm sure any artist who's selected, you know, you could feel utterly daunted by it. And of course, to feel daunted is to maybe feel almost like frozen, like, you know, uh, from, from the fear of it. And I have to say, my, my major fear is the lack of time um, without having the time to spend as yet worrying about the after effect of, of you know, when the work is installed. I mean, something, you know, us artists learn on the job, so to speak, is that when you make a, an artwork and it's out there in the public arena, like at the art fair here or in an exhibition or whatever, uh, you've got to let it go. You can't, you can't stand there and, and protect it and explain it um, and, and change it, although, although I know, I, I, remember, I remember hearing, I, I thought it was fantastic that Oh, the wonderful um, British painter Turner would, would go into the gallery and want to paint more on his paintings and stuff. I mean, I think, you know, for an artist, it's like, you know, the work is maybe never quite finished in your head, or when it is finished, you know, then it's on to the next thing. Um, but, yeah, uh, I haven't got to that point yet, you know, of looking back, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, living with the idea in my, my mind. And so, so that's really... And because my installation will be made up a lot of components, um, I live in my mind what, how I hope they will come together. Um, but so much of my, my daily existence now is feeling like I'm just lost in the, in the detail of struggling to make each component and then perhaps fearful of, how that, of what kind of strength that component will have um, along with all the other things, because you want them all to sort of like fit in with each other and kind of give and take from each other, but each one have a, like carry its weight, you know, like um, like a group of guys, you know, carrying a coffin into a church, you know, they've got to share the weight around. So it's that thing of like, you know, with my sadness, badness, madness, some um, uh, intention that each each element, each each, um, uh, each work actually uh, is a good sort of pallbearer, I suppose. I've not put it in that terms before, those terms before, but yeah, pallbearers. That's what I'm, I'm working on at present. Um, so, other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, could, could everyone hear the question? It was, what particular material does Fiona like working with? And also, the last one, is her workshop in a nice, clean, uh, kept in a clean way? Um, the materials... I don't like working with are the ones are the ones I'm working with at any particular moment, um, because it's like you've sort of got a there's a struggle, and I think you know this is the artist's you know thing. There's a struggle to get the material to do what you want it to, um, uh, and but there's a sense of elation, you know, personal elation when you feel that it has worked for you. Um, that you have managed to make it do what you want it to. 
Um, uh, and so then when I get to that point, I really love that material. So I, won't, I mean, I do have materials I've worked with uh, on and off, like uh, sardine tins I'm sort of known for in Australia. Um, uh, now camouflage garments I'm working with quite a lot. Um, money I've worked with quite a lot in different ways. I love working with money. It's um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, there's a bit of that, you know, I'm still working with now. Um, so uh, I, I probably equally favor all those materials, but also other things I might work with as well. Um, and I think, yeah, it is that it's having, you know, the the image in your head and knowing, put it this way, you know when it's not there, you know? I want, you just know, you can't kid yourself that to get, to get it's not just getting the material to, to break some sort of, you know, barrier of its banality and it's, you know, coming from the everyday world to become something else. Uh, you know, you know when you know what you're aiming for has fallen flat on its face, and you know when it's sort of somehow picked itself up and it's it's going forward. Um, to get back to your question about my so-called workshop, I work at home in a very domestic situation, like extremely domestic. Um, I think a lot of artists people think they've got grand studios. Some of them do, but not necessarily. Um, I'm one of the ones that doesn't have a grand studio, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Did we have another? Hi, Fiona. Thank you for the talk, and it was great to see the um, documenter work again. Do you want to say something about um, the new pavilion um, in Venice and how you're working towards that? Because it must be quite difficult, as you can't actually get it in it till possibly quite late in the day. Mm. That's a good question. For people who don't know, Australia um, uh, is rebuilding its pavilion in the Giardini in, in Venice. And uh, I've learned a bit of the history of, of, of our pavilion because I'm the next uh, Australian representative. Australia was the last nation to gain a spot in the Giardini back in, I think, the early 70s for a pavilion. Um, uh, and that was put there, I think, quite quickly. So it was always classified as a temporary pavilion. And it's only because it's classified as uh, temporary that we've been able to... And it was always trouble. It was um, probably not, not the best design for a, an art gallery. Um, kind of space or an art exhibiting kind of space and it also leaked and had all sorts of other attendant problems which drove every artist up the wall who ever showed there from the stories I've heard. Um, but it's only because it was temporary that uh, Australia was allowed to dismantle it and now they're building a new one and one of the um, uh, members of the Australia Council who's working on the next, um, on getting the pavilion uh, up and ready for the, the opening next May, um, said that the Australian Pavilion has some sort of European historic listing. Like they can't just dismantle it in Venice and then chuck, chuck all the bits in a skip because um, it's got historic listing. But if they bring it back to Australia, because they're looking for home for it, if they bring it back to Australia and then it's put on a skip, well, it's not in Europe, so it's okay. Um, rules are rules, it's all very interesting. Um, okay, now the new pavilion, designed by a Melbourne architectural group, Denton Corker Marshall, who are well known in Australia, and I think it's a fantastic design, and of, of course you could say I'm a bit biased, maybe. Um, uh, it's, but it's very simple, it's a building of our time, um, but I think it will, it, it's not a building which um, takes precedent as a building over whatever an artist is going to do with it. Um, and of course, there's an architecture biennale in Venice every other year from the art one now. So the, the pavilions, all the pavilions in the Giardini get used for what, at least eight months of every year. It's um, quite impressive. Um, the 
pavilion that's been designed is basically almost like a simple cube, not quite cubic. Um, it's on the footprint of the other one, of course, which has dictated its size, but I think it's dimensionally, it's roughly in the ballpark of 15 by 16 meters, one space, um, uh, ceiling height about 5 or 5.5 meters, one viewing window, which can be covered up if the artist chooses, um, and um, uh, very simple cladding on the outside. So it's not, it's not a building trying to make a statement. It's not a building like, say, you know, uh, the Guggenheim of, of Bilbao or anything like that, which is a magnificent building, but which, you know, I'm certainly not the only, I've never been there, so I'm, I'm, I'm not, not speaking from experience, but I know it's been criticized somewhat for, you know, how, how well it displays art. And, and I've even heard with the Guggenheim in New York designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, which is a great building. It's like, well, it's a great building, but you know, how well does it work as a gallery? Um, uh, but I think the Australian Pavilion is, uh, it's as big as it could be on the, on the site that we have. It's small, it's not, it's like, it's like Goldilocks. It's not too big, it's not too small, and it's simple. Um, so, great. And of course, as, as Australia is, very, um, very happy to be able to say we are the only nation uh, to get a building in the 21st century uh, in Venice. Nothing is forever, but for now, apparently the doors are closed or the gates closed. No, uh, there's no other space available for any nation that doesn't already have a building there. Um, any other questions? No? Well, thanks very much for coming.